And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah to kick off today's presentation. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your Friday afternoon. Um, just have a, a kind of intro presentation to a topic that maybe some of you have heard about but didn't know the details, or maybe this is completely new to you, um, APP postgraduate programs. Um, I chose to call it APP because usually these are open to both PAs and nurse practitioners. Um, they're not usually focused one way or another, so it does encompass bo both groups um, depending on what uh, APP career you choose. So um, what is post-grad training in itself? So it would be a one-year specialty program um, that you would go into after graduating from PA school and passing your NCCPA boards, which is the National Board Accrediting Body. Um, often they have a variety of labels, um, such as a residency program, fellowship, or even just postgraduate uh, program. These all usually mean the same thing. It's just dependent on what they choose to call them. Um, it can be confusing when you're talking about them to others because um, similar to like the medical path for physicians, they go through residency and fellowship usually, which are years long. Um, so often for APPs, it's just a one-year program. The purpose of it is to extend your training in a field of interest in a structured setting for a set period of time instead of jumping right into the, the workforce, starting a job, and kind of being committed to that specialty and that job for an extended period of time. You know, no one interviews for a job saying, well, I would like to, you know, be in this job for a year to see if it's a good fit for me. Um, that's not how you win an employer over. So um, post-grad training is a great way to say, like, this is how I want to dip my toes in the water, and then I can consider what I want after this. So in general, to start from the beginning, PA school has clinical requirements um, before you can even do a, a PA PA um, graduate program. So depending on the program structure that you would go to, this is PA specific, um, different than nurse practitioner. Um, you would have 12 to 16 months of rotations full time. So this is usually your second year of PA school. And you're usually working full time, if not even a little bit more than that during your clinical rotations. And this can come out to about 2000 hours of clinical experience by the time you graduate PA school. So if you think about it and you choose to do one specialty in a, a fellowship program for one year, you're getting an additional 2,000 hours of experience in one specific field. So it is quite um, a, a great experience compared to how many hours you have in a variety of fields. There are required clinical rotations that may or may not give you the exposure or desired time in a field of specialty that you wanna practice in. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. And elective rotations can be difficult to set up for certain specialties, and they don't guarantee that doing a one-month uh, elective rotation helps you feel prepared enough to enter that subspecialty in the workforce. So my fellowship experience, um, wait, let me make sure we didn't go. Oh, here we are. Um, for PA school clinical requirements, ARC-PA is the accrediting body who determines if your program is accredited or not and what um, things we have to fulfill in order to graduate with a, a degree. So per ARC-PA, these are the rotations that you'll have to take in PA school no matter what. So family, emergency medicine, internal um, surgery, pediatrics, women's health, which usually includes OB and gyn, behavioral and mental health care. So you fill these core requirements up and then usually depending on your program, um, you're going to have the opportunity to take electives and other subspecialty locations. But like I said, sometimes electives can be two weeks, you know, or a month long and, and not super long if you are interested in something other than the core requirements from ARCPA. So specifically my fellowship experience, I did a 12-month um, program in a field that I was interested in. Um, and I, I did choose neurosurgery. I, I did not have any um, exposure to it during PA school. I had worked as a CNA in a neurosurgery unit, so that's how I knew I was interested in the first place. But I kind of knew early on that PA school probably wasn't going to give me the surgical subspecialty um, hands-on experience I wanted to jump right into a job. So I was paid as a PGY-1, which is equivalent to the interns um, in the uh, hospital that I did my fellowship at. Um, so as an intern pay, it was $58,000 back in 2020. Um, that was my salary for being in a training program. And uh, once offered, I had 10 days to decide if I was going to take it. Uh, in my program, I had assigned monthly rotations um, with supervising physicians and usually large teams of PA guidance uh, around me. I applied for this program in the fall of my 
uh, PAS two year, so um, second year clinical rotations in 2019. I had already set up a rotation to rotate in the department that I wanted to do this fellowship in. So I ended up rotating with them in January of 2020. Um, so that the people in the program knew me, they, it was kind of like an audition rotation. They saw how I worked with the team um, and if I would be a good fit. So then I interviewed with them after my rotation was done um, in the spring and they offered me the position in the summer right before graduation. And I started in the fall. So I think I graduated a little delayed because of COVID. So it was like the end of August, 2020. And then I started this um, fellowship program, I think one, maybe three weeks, four weeks later. So pretty quickly. Pre prerequisites to entering the program was to have a state license where it was a DEA license, which is um, to prescribe uh, BA, BLS and ACLS, which are your uh, life-saving certifications, and then being board certified. The nice thing was um, that I didn't obviously have to have my state license in hand and ready to go since I was technically a trainee. Um, it was allowed to be pending at the time that I was starting fellowship. And my fellowship program covered all the costs of getting these certifications. So um, compared to when you would just enter the job force and not do a fellowship, you would be responsible for processing your state um, license and paying for that. And then you'd also be responsible for the DEA license. Those are probably the two that take the most time and are the most financially cumbersome. Uh, DEA license um, now is $888 and it goes up almost every um, two years. And the state license can depend be dependent on state, but um, I did my fellowship in Arizona. So I think it was um, initially $400. So you, you do have to have a little bit of money up, upright to just um, get your licensing done when you enter the job force. So it was very nice to have help with these um, and have them covered while starting my um, fellowship. So here is what the structure was of my neurosurgery fellowship. Um, I had cerebrovascular, neuro-oncology, critical care, pain ma management, physical medicine, rehab, infectious disease, peripheral nerve, spine, cranial and skull-based, stereotactic and functional neurosurgery, general and stroke neurology, neuroradiology, neurosurgical trauma, and pediatric neurosurgery. So I did a lot of um, neurosurgery specific subspecialties within neurosurgery. And then I also did a lot of um, rotations with specialties that we work closely with, or it's helpful to know um, what those specialties offer to the neurosurgery field. So it was quite comprehensive. I was not just in um, one neurosurgery department for 12 months straight. I had a curriculum um, and I had uh, rotations that I changed from month to month with different preceptors with related to the field that I was going into. So by the time that I had finished this program, I had over 100 surgeries on a case log, um, which is pretty good to do in a year, and then uh, over 2,000 hours of experience related to this field at the time of graduation. Um, because I was a you know fellow treated like an intern, um, you work long hours, you take call, you're treated just like a resident would be um, expectation-wise. So I had quite a few hours of experience given from this opportunity. The nice thing about Fellowship was that it was also structured learning compared to jumping into a job. Um, we had grand rounds lectures weekly um, that I could listen and, and um, learn from, from physicians. Um, we had monthly assignments on topics that I presented to my program director, um, so starting really basic, such as things like of low back pain, and then talking about spinal fusion, and then um, maybe on um, neuro-oncology. So I had different topics that I had to research and put a PowerPoint together. Um, I was given a guidebook that had recommended readings for each rotation from this book they provided me. So I had like guided um, ways to study before starting a rotation. At the end, I did have a final exam. I, I think it was like 100 questions for clinical competency. Um, it was pass fail. And if I failed, you, you just retook it. Um, it was just to make sure that you had learned all of the uh, requirements and, and guide uh, marks that they wanted you to have before finishing. And I, I got a certificate of training after this. So you don't finish fellowship with like another master's degree or any, or a clinical doctorate, nothing like that. It's usually just a certificate in itself for doing it. So pros and cons. Um, when you do it, it's a paid and structured training environment. It can be easier to transition with credentialing and a known start date compared to entering the workforce. 
So we, I briefly mentioned this already, um, but sometimes, and people don't realize it, that even though you've, maybe you've accepted a job while you're still in PA school and they're like, perfect, we are just waiting for you to pass boards and we'll get your credentialing started, um, you know, with the state and the hospital. Oftentimes this takes um, anywhere from three to six months and it, do, it does happen frequently to graduates who are not warned and you can graduate from PA school and sit around for months on end without income while waiting to start your job. So when you do a fellowship and you're you know technically con considered a learner and they have a very hard fast start date, you could graduate PA school and then weeks later you know start employment even if it's at a reduced salary. Um, it's something. There's also um, possible job opportunities after completing um, a fellowship or connections for jobs in that field. So a lot of fellowships have the intent of kind of on the job training where they see if you're a good fit that they could offer you a job when you're done, you can stay on the team that you're doing your fellowship with. Or you could determine that the fellowship you did was not a good fit for you, but you rotated in other departments and you made connections in that hospital. And then you can easily transition to another specialty because you already worked in that hospital system. Um, and like I said, uh, it could be a great way to determine that the field is not for you by doing this just for one year. You often are more marketable on resumes and useful for salary negotiations to say that you are um, fellowship trained in the specialty, which is pretty rare for PAs to, to be able to say that they can do that. Um, and I would say in my personal experience, um, it has definitely made me more marketable. I've had more interviews and um, questions about this on my resume than anything else and it's been, I've been able to negotiate my salary higher because I did essentially two to three years of neurosurgery experience and one year of fellowship. So they were able to bump my salary offers um, based on my experience. Um, so that's what I mean by it. like can advance your clinical knowledge and skills at a pace that could take two to three years of acquire in a non-structured environment. It's not to say that you couldn't start a job um, straight out of PA school where you have all of these things that are still satisfied, but it's often har hard to figure that out in an interview and know that that's promised and expected in a way that a fellowship can offer it to you. Some cons, um, obviously you're deferring entering the workforce by one year. So this is mostly um, for financial reasons. So you're, you're taking a pay cut, usually half if not more of what a PA could be offered. Um, like I said, I made 58,000 the first year. Um, you um, may not have as many benefits. You may not get retirement offered to you during fellowship and you definitely may are gonna have less PTO than a, a regular PA. So I was lucky enough that I did have medical and dental and vision benefits. I did have um, their option to contribute to a retirement and my PTO was less than the other PAs. I think I only got 10 or 14 days for the whole year compared to, you know, PAs in the department who were employed, I think had closer to a month. Um, you could do a fellowship in a specialty that you very quickly learn you don't enjoy. And now you're stuck finishing this, you know, fellowship for a year as well. And lastly, the program could be poorly structured. It could have lack of oversight or mentorship, and it could just feel like you joined something that's on the job training where you are independently doing the job, no one's really helping you and you're making less money. So it's great to talk to um, people who've done the fellowship experience before you, make sure that your program really does have all the things they're offering and promising you. Um, and if it's a new one, kind of double checking that you are gonna have the guidance you want in a structured learning environment and that you're not just getting paid less while you're training for a year. Um, the next three are resources to find out about PA programs, uh, our postgraduate PA programs, because they're not, um, it's not universal. This is a new thing. So there's not like one database to find everything. Um, one is going to be this APPAP um, website.org. It's the Association of Postgraduate PA Programs. Theirs is pretty comprehensive and they have a lot on their website. Um, it did not have my fellowship on this. I believe I found mine simply through Google search. So keep that in mind. Google can still be helpful, even though it's not on a database. The next one is um, AASPA. This is the American Association of Surgical Physician Assistants. So they only post residency programs, obviously related to surgical subspecialties. And the last one would be PA school fullfinder.com. Um, they have like little folders with a bunch of fellowships organized through them on their website as well. So three pretty good resources um, to look through if you're considering this. 
All right. Um, lastly, I just have recommendations and then we can go through questions. I know that's kind of quick, um, but my overall recommendation is if fellowships sound interesting to you, you should actively investigate the requirements and the application timeline of that program and have it in the back of your mind, even when you're starting PA school. Um, this can help you set up a rotation in the department so they get familiar with you if you, want, you have the opportunity to do an away rotation or an elective. Um, and then you have time to gather the letters of recommendation you need, write an essay. And that way also, you know, uh, application dates can sneak up on you. And I had to uh, apply at the end of my second year, so nearer to graduation. But I have heard of people where the application deadline was still during the first year of PA school. So you have to apply pretty early to not know about something you're going to do a year and a half later. Um, so you can set yourself up for success by just considering this early. Um, as I already mentioned, point two would be, if possible, try to set up an elective rotation at the program that you want to do a fellowship at if it's possible. Um, I really uh, found that I was kind of on the fence about doing a fellowship. And then after I rotated in the department, I, I was totally sold and was hoping that I could uh, get the spot to be there. So it's helpful to make up your mind as well. Lastly, um, continue to look for jobs, even if you are considering a fellowship. So don't put all your eggs in one basket and say, I am definitely doing a fellowship after PA school. I'm not going in the workforce. I'm not interested in it. Um, PA fellowships are pretty competitive. There's not a lot of them. Sometimes they accept one or two PAs um, per class. So it's not like you're going to have your choosing of, uh, you know, to fall back on if you don't get into one or two fellowships you apply for. So you should be applying for fellowships and considering it, but also um, applying to jobs as well. So you have options for yourself. Um, so that you're not just stuck without a job after graduating. And that's everything. Um, I guess we can open up to questions here. Thanks so much, Sarah. I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet or in the chat. So okay. I want to give folks a second to process the information and ask any questions they might have. Sounds good. I'm just curious to get a sense of who's on the call. Where are you? Um, where are you guys at in your pre-health journey? I know some are preparing for graduate school. What um, area are you currently studying? Feel free to post in the chat. I have a question here. Um, it was at one point in my timeline that I know I wanted to go into neurosurgery. Um, I decided pretty early um, just because I had done my patient care experience hours in a neurosurgery step down unit. So I'd already taken care of a lot of like spine and um, cranial surgery patients. Um, and so I was already interested from the get go. And so when I got into PA school, you know, neuro came very easy to me. I liked the neuroanatomy. So I, I had already started Googling like what opportunities I had, um, for neurosurgery jobs and found the fellowship. So it probably was first year PA school. I'd already decided for both PA school and fellowships, who were your preceptors? Were they PAs or attendings or something else? So, um, it was both. So usually I, rotated in a certain specialty. So say I did um, spine for one month. Um, I would then be assigned to a, uh, attending the, the surgeon himself um, to be like one-on-one -on -one with him that month and learn everything. But also there was like 10 PAs in the department as well. So often I was buddied up with a PA to follow them around and they actually oversaw everything. So it wasn't like I was the surgeon's PA one-on-one, -on -one, but there was a PA involved. So it was usually about like a PA and the physician and myself. Usually there were smaller specialties like um, neuro-oncology is a pretty small subspecialty group. And every day it was just the, the um, physician and myself who was my preceptor. So it just depended on um, which rotation I was on, but it usually was a physician directly. And then is it okay to go the medical route if your school doesn't offer the PA path? I'm a second year student in college. Um, there, you do not need to go to a school that offers a PA path. I don't know if you mean if they offer, if they have a PA school or if you just mean they don't have like a pre-PA um, degree. You don't need any certain type of degree to go to PA school. Um, oftentimes the requirements 
to apply to PA school are exactly the same as medical school um, minus like the MCAT. So you can be pre-med um, and still fulfill the requirements to become a PA. Um, PAs often just need more patient care hours. So that's like usually the biggest hurdle. And a lot of the reasons why people do advanced e-clinical training is to get a certificate so that you can have patient care. So you can become a PA no matter what um, undergraduate you go to. What would I recommend if you have multiple specialties that are of interest to you, but you would like to attend a fellowship program to get more training? Um, cast your net wide. Basically, you should try and do your rotations in the two or three specialties you're um, interested in during PA school. Look into fellowships for those multiple specialties um, and also apply for jobs in those specialties. Usually you're going to get a good idea if you have the opportunity to rotate it uh, in it if it's a good fit for you. And the again, the worst thing that can happen is that you do a, a fellowship and it makes it very clear to you that it's not a good fit. You have not wasted a year of your life. You have ga gathered very important clinical hour experience. Um, you've still completed something and gotten a certificate for it that shows your hard work. And there's no such thing as bad clinical experience hours. So you're still a better PA for it in the end. So if you're uh, interested in multiple things, pursue multiple things. No harm done in doing that. We don't have to make up our minds um, like the match program that um, pre-medical -med students or um, medical students do to go to residency and they have to pick one thing um, or, or just two things. Um, you can consider a lot of things all at once. Is it worth reapplying to fellowship the following year if we don't get selected the first year or should we just find a job? Um, there are people who um, already were PAs working in a field that they didn't like or they weren't interested in um, and they wanted to change what specialty they were in. So they found that the best way to do that was to do a PA fellowship. So you definitely could, I'll give an example. Someone wants to go into a surgical subspecialty uh, but they couldn't find a surgical job that would hire a new grad. So they took a job like in critical care and they worked in it for four years. And they're like, all right, I have enough experience. I'm still interested in getting into the OR. There are people who apply to fellowships and then still get it selected to, to do a fellowship program to switch over to surgical subspecialty. So if, you, if you're finding yourself in a position where you don't like the career you've chosen um, or the subspecialty you've chosen and you want to switch, a fellowship is a good option as well. What do you think about the PCST? Is it worth taking it? Does it change anything? Um, the PA, oh, sorry, PA cat. So I um, look into the PA cat every couple months just to make sure that I'm up to date on it. And what I'm finding right now is that not a lot of programs require it. Um, when I mentor my students, I tell them to make a PA school wish list of about 10 to 15 schools, and then they make an Excel sheet um, with all of the data of their schools in it. And one of the things I say to point out is, Find out if your wish list requires the PA cat anywhere, and then weigh the pros and cons of taking the PA cat for maybe only one school you're interested in. Um, if it's your dream school and they require it, require it, obviously you should pursue the PA cat because you want to get into that program. But if you find that your wish list doesn't have a single school that requires the PA cat, then don't take it. Don't spend more money and time studying if you don't need to. I think we're heading in a trajectory where it could be, be become more universal, um, but I don't see that happening in the application cycle starting in April of 2025. Maybe we'd be seeing it the years after. Great questions, everybody. Is there something that I did that I'm glad I did or wish you did while you were in college? Um, Hmm. Well, I'm actually pretty glad that I took a gap year. I, I do tell a lot of my mentees not to be afraid of it and uh, to be lead with an open mind. You're not in any of a rush um, to get into the career force. You're going to work until you retire. So one year is not going to make or break um, your career choice. Um, so I didn't have a lot of patient care hours by senior year of college. I think I had like maybe 500 and it came down to me saying, well, should I apply this year and not be super competitive? Um, or should I just take one more year, work full time and then apply? And that's what I ended up doing. And I then ended up applying to PA school with like 2,500 hours. And I was a way, way more competitive applicant. And I enjoyed my gap year. I got to see family and friends and gave my brain some rest from studying. Um, you know, it took a year off to just kind of breathe after college, traveled, saved some money. And then I went into PA school, like feeling refreshed. So 
I'm very glad that I did that. And I don't regret it. Even though at the time it felt very scary as a choice, I do recommend it to everybody now. What patient care experience job did I find that helped me the most during PA school? So um, advanced e-clinical training did not exist when I was looking for um, a job to kind of get a certificate to get my foot in the door. So I ended up taking a CNA course, um, certified nursing assistant at a local nursing home in my college town. Um, it was full time for, I think, three or four weeks. Um, so I did it in the summer. And then I worked at that nursing home on the weekends in college. So I slowly accumulated those 500 hours. Then because I had been a nursing aide in a nursing home, it was much easier to apply for jobs and get interviews at a hospital. So in my gap year, I applied and got a job on the neurosurgery step-down unit as a nursing aide um, and did that full time in my gap year. So I started as a CNA and then transitioned to a you know patient care tech slash nurse's aide. What's the best way to track how many patient care hours you have? Um, pay stubs. So you're going to get paid and it's going to say the number of hours you worked, especially if you're an hourly employee. Just keep your pay stubs in a file on your computer or an Excel sheet, um, and then you can tally them up when it's time to apply. What would I recommend for a pre-PA student with a low college GPA? Is there something I can do to increase my acceptable rate with a low GPA. Two things I tell people with low GPAs who are not competitive would be weighing the pros and cons of doing a post back program. So like um, either a master's degree in some sort of health sciences and doing a killer job and getting like a, you know, 3.7 or higher in a master's. So that way, when you apply, you can say, college, I didn't do so great, but I've proven myself. And I took, I did another master's degree um, for one year and really excelled in that program. Obviously that is a time and financial commitment and more debt to take on to do another master's degree, but people do post back programs when their GPA is really bad. Uh, the other thing would be depending on um, uh, what college you're close to, um, if you can do a community college or if you can stay at a bigger university, it would be just taking more science classes. Um, during after you've graduated in the summer, fall, winter, um, which I think more people often do is just take more science classes and get like A's in them, focus on them. And then that brings their GPA up a, a few, you know, points, um, maybe like from a 3.2 to like a 3.6 if you do really well. So one of those two options. Does it make you more competitive to have working experience beyond PA school before applying to fellowship? Um, I don't think anyone's going to have an answer for that one way or another. I'm sure it depends on like how personable you are and if they think that you're um, uh, just a good applicant to join that program. Um, I, everyone I know in my program, there's been five PA fellows in neurosurgery. All of us were new grads, so none of us um, had another job before going to the fellowship program, but I don't think it's a, a pro or a con either way. Do you have to take the GRE? If so, when do you recommend taking it? How long study resources do you suggest before taking it? So um, GRE is the same answer as the PA CAT answer. Um, you need to make a PA school wish list, see who requires the GRE first to determine if you're going to take it. Um, and then as far as studying, depends on the type of learner you are. So either you buy a book on Amazon and you buckle down for a month and you finish a GRE prep book, or you're someone who needs instructions like in front of you and you sign up for a GRE prep weekend course. Um, I don't think that you need to take the GRE until you have finished everything else, your prerequisites, your patient care hours, your volunteer hours, your letters of recommendation, your personal statement. So the GRE can really be like at the very tail end of applying to PA school. What's the average cost of a three-year PA program? Um, this is wildly variable depending on if you're in-state or out-of-state or if you go to a private program. So I went to an in-state program um, in Indiana, and I think my program was only like fifty or 60000 a year, so times two because my program was 27 months. So I, I did take on like, I think, um, like $120,000 of debt versus there are private programs where it's even more expensive than that, and you can graduate PA school with $200,000 of debt. So I don't think there's an average, but you can expect it to be six figures um, in that ballpark range. Anything else?
No, I don't see any additional questions in the Q&A or the chat. That was great. There was a lot, a lot of good questions. Make sure I didn't Absolutely. miss anything. And thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your experience and information. Ooh, looks like one just popped in. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Um, is there something I wish I that I did in college? Um, probably focused less on getting into PA school. Um, it was like my main focus. I think maybe I could have lived in the moment a little bit more and um, had balance. And it's a it's a slide that I give to all of my mentees when we have our Zoom meeting is not to lose yourself in the uh, pursuit of medicine um, or rush through life. Like I said, you're going to be in your career for like 40, over 40 years. So um, I wish I had kind of just enjoyed the college experience a little more and known that I, um, as long as I was doing well, I did deserve the time to enjoy being a college student. I didn't, there's nothing like that I wish I did to prepare more for PA school. I, I wish I did less. What advice would I give to a college student in their second year? I, uh, I also tell this to my mentees um, when we have our meeting is just having um, a year, years, like all of your college years planned in advance with just soft things that you want to hit every year. So you don't have to be hyper focused on every small detail, but maybe your plan is to apply during senior year of college. So from this month in, you know, July of 2025, what do you need to have done by April 2020? seven to um to apply to PA school and writing all of that out having a timeline in front of you with soft check marks of when you're gonna have your prereqs done um how many patient care hours you need to uh, accumulate over the course of two years that sort of thing so making a timeline for you to like have in front of you on your computer your background and your desk so that you have you're looking at it every day so planning ahead any courses I think helped during PA school um I mean, the prerequisites to get into PA school are, are super helpful because you take them again in PA school at a harder level. So like my anatomy lab was just so great in undergrad that it made anatomy lab in college much easier. Um, I also took medical terminology, which was required by a couple of PA schools, but it was super helpful. It was only one credit and I learned a lot. And then one of my favorite classes was um, actually like a public health policy course that was not required, but I took it um, for a minor, but it was um, healthcare in America. And it talked about insurance, like how insurance works, billing, um, all of it, like something I had nothing, no clue about. Um, and I wish I remembered even more of it when I got into the workforce as a PA, because insurance is such a huge thing in your job when you start working that people don't tell you about. So um, healthcare in America was a, a great class. If you have something like it at your college, I recommend it. Do you think PA school also look beyond your GPA? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think PA school are always looking for well-rounded applicants and it's not just people who are 4.0s and nothing. Um, there's a reason the CASPA application this year started a section called life experiences where you can free text um, the challenges and um, burdens you've overcome to be, to apply to PA school. So they're definitely looking for people who've gone through things and overcome struggles and, and still want to pursue this career. So yeah, they look past GPA. It just can't be so low that you get weeded out. So obviously a lot of programs say their minimum is a 3.0. If, if you're, if you know, a 2.9, you might just get weeded out right away because they automatically have a system to do so. But if you're in their range, if you find yourself in their data that they accept 3.0 and above, then do it. Do you have to go the pre-med route or can nursing students also get into the PA program? Nursing students can get into um, PA program. I know nurses who chose to become PAs instead of nurse practitioners. Um, they just kind of look, it just depends on your lifestyle. Um, like if you're a nurse who only can take night classes and wants to keep working full time because you, you can't afford to take on more debt, um, at nurse practitioner school often can be done part-time. PA school cannot be done part-time. So if you're in a, in a situation where PA sounds a little more appealing to you because it's the medical model of training and you're able to step away from your full-time job to go into PA school full-time, there are nurses who've done that too. So you definitely can be a nurse and become a PA. Does my resume still include all the things I did in high school? 
No. Um, once you apply to PA school, uh, basically it's freshman year in college onward, and you do not include high school experiences on your resume. There's a lot of good questions. Keep them coming if you have them. We have time. <clears throat> All right, it looks like we don't have any more questions coming in. So, with, oh, I spoke too soon again. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, you can have my advanced e-clinical email, which is, um, oh, forgive me. Let me make sure I don't give you the wrong one. S.Rebe, R-E-B-E-Y, at advclinical.org. And maybe I can type it in the box below so everyone can copy and paste it if you didn't hear it. And um, as mentioned by Janie when we started, um, if you do an ACT um, course, like the MA course or phlebotomist, you get free mentoring included in that. Um, and you can request me as, as a mentor if you'd like um, for the year of your subscription. If you don't need to get a certificate, you can also just purchase mentoring through ACT where we meet one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom and I'll help you with all the guidance of that. So you can also purchase um, a mentorship with me and uh, there's a discount code for that, which is Sarah 300 if you're interested. Oh, I see two more questions here. What are some things I should do during PA1 to boost my chances of getting into fellowship? Um, I would say showing early interest in that fellowship program, rotating in the department if you can as well, maintaining good um, GPA in PA school, um, and then making sure you have pretty much a solid reason why you're interested to go in that field. A lot of the questions I answered were like, why did you choose neuros neurosurgery? Why is this important to you? Um, why didn't you choose other fields? So just kind of being passionate about the one that you're interested in. Any recommendations on ways to land at the job, a job at the places we do clinicals as a PA too? Yeah, um, this is a pretty common way people get offered jobs even without asking is if you do really good job on the rotation. Coming in early, staying late, um, having good social um, kind of acknowledgement and awareness, um, not talking about inappropriate things or getting too personal on rotations, um, making sure that you um, get the work done in an appropriate amount of time, um, getting along with other people who you rotate with on the team, just kind of being a standout student on a rotation can sometimes lead you to getting a job offer. If you're not offered one, um, definitely tell your preceptor at the end, like, I really enjoyed this rotation. I could see myself doing this field. Can I have your email or contact info if your department is hiring or is interested? Um, so just a, a showing interest when you're on that rotation as well. I'm afraid to say we don't have more questions so they'll pop in, so. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. And thank you so much for all the information you shared. Hopefully we answered all the questions. Um, Sarah did put her email in the chat for everyone to see. If not, let me copy and paste one more time. And hopefully you see it now. And as she mentioned, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And we also have the option to enroll for a mentorship if you need it. Um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone so much for joining today's call and hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.